And we now move on to questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. And I call Mrs Sandra Overend. Question one, please. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. As at uh, the 31st of December 2015, 50% of patients waiting longer than 13 weeks uh, waited longer than 13 weeks to access psychological therapies were waiting to be seen by adult mental health services. The equivalent figure on the 31st of December 2014 was 64%. Therefore, while this is clearly too high and further work is needed, I am pleased to say that we have been able to make some progress in addressing these pressures in our adult mental health services waiting lists. As part of this work, I recently allocated £1.6 million to the Health and Social Care Board. This will provide a, a much-needed boost to the provision of specialist mental health psychological services for individuals with complex mental health problems and directly enhanced services to help general practitioners avail of talking therapies for patients with depression. Mrs. Obran for a supplementary. Uh, thank you. And indeed, the figures that are that are available are very concerning. And the minister um, has has made representations that I could I could ask a half a dozen questions with regard to the figures. Um, they are very concerning. Uh, almost half of uh, 569 of patients waiting longer than 13 weeks uh, to access psychological therapies at the end of November 2015 were in the Southern Eastern Trust. Um, like 92% of those waiting in, this, in the Southern Trust area um, are waiting for mental health and 56% in the Northern Trust area. It's difficult to define those figures for Mid Ulster specifically, but the figures are concerning. And what can the Minister advise if, if he can identify specific a problems in various trust areas? There, there are no, I, mean, I think I, I agree and accept um, the point around these are, these are not acceptables and they are acceptable figures and they are worrying, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, in, in respect of the length of people who are having to wait over the 13 uh, week period for um, the psychological therapies and adult mental health services specifically that the uh, member has inquired about. Um, we don't ha I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to take a look at, at whether we can furnish the member with more specific information in respect of the, her constituency or indeed you know, some, some, some subset perhaps of, of the, the Western Trust area. Um, but the, I think the, and, and the Northern Trust as well. Um, there are obviously uh, a range of pressures facing not just this area of, of, of the department uh, and the, the health services work, but a, a range of, of, of different areas as well. And, and that's why I think you know, this is not an area where I'm sitting saying that there isn't, don't, don't recognize that there is an issue. Don't rec it's not that I'm sitting saying I don't think there is a problem here. Um, it's also not a situation where we're not seeing some improvement year on year. So I think it was, it was as I mentioned in, in my answer, it's 64% of those waiting longer than 13 weeks um, December of last year, that has now fallen to 50%. I'm not saying in any way that that is an acceptable level, but it is a measure of some improvement. It reflects some additional investment that has been going into this area, and particularly around uh, the creation of, of talking therapy hubs in many parts uh, of Northern Ireland, including areas which would cover uh, the members' constituency. I mentioned some investment, particularly the £1.6 million, which went into making sure that we were delivering what are, what are referred to as directly enhanced services, many of which are which is about 12,000 um, uh, sessions done per year, particularly the likes of counselling with those who are suffering uh, from depression. So there, there are a lot of things going on. Now, there are some areas, and members asked a specific question about, about um, spaces and um, blind spots, perhaps in particular our, our trust areas. I'm happy to come back and uh, reflect on that and come back to the member with any details that I might have about that. Mr. Sammy Douglas. Here. Um, could I ask the Minister um, how much has spending increased on mental health services in Northern Ireland? since the publication of the Bamford report? I, I think there is an interesting, I thank the member for, for his question, Mr. Speaker. There, there is an interesting sort of public debate actually going on over the last number of days, um, led in part by, by the Prime Minister, um, around the need to, as a result of, a, of some criticism of mental health services uh, in England and the investment in mental health services in England, um, which has again brought to the, the fore a discussion, the need to have a discussion about mental health and to try to destigmatise mental health, because I think we all um, recognise and reflect Mr McCarthy is in the chamber in a previous earlier debate today referred to mental health services as the Cinderella service of the, um, the health service for many years. And I think that is a reasonable enough um, uh, description. Um, I think in, in Northern Ireland, and I'm not saying that, and I would, wouldn't stand up here and say that we have got everything perfect or right by any means, but I think the, the Bamford review and the report and the recommendations that flowed from that 
um, was a, a sort of a watershed moment in many respects uh, in terms of mental health in Northern Ireland. And it will be a long, and it will be probably a quite slow, and it's sometimes perhaps a frustrating journey to make a vision, to make the reality a reality of the vision that was contained within the Bamford report. But I think what's significant is that since that uh, report, we have significantly increased by by over uh, a quarter the expenditure annually on mental health services in Northern Ireland from uh, 200, roughly £200 million pounds annually to uh, now a quarter of a billion pounds annually. Uh, and, and, and significantly within that, uh, there has been a switch away from spending that money um, and looking after people in hospitals or in, in institutions, many of which were, were, not, were no longer fit for purpose, to into the, the community. So in, we're in 2004-05, pre-Bamford, we were spending about 46% of that money in, the, in a community-based setting. That has now increased to nearly, it's about 57%, so it's nearly 60%. I think that is as significant a moment as any increase in, in expenditure would be, that we're spending this money on people looking after them in their communities, close to their home, close to their families. Pat Sheehan. Would the Minister agree with me that the appointment of a mental health champion here in the North to promote the, the rights and the interests of, of those people with mental health problems uh, as, as, uh, would, would go a long way to improving uh, the, the affairs of those with mental health problems, as recommended by the Action Health, uh, sorry, Action Health, Action Mental Health, and others. Thank the, the member for his question, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm aware of the, of the suggestion that has been made by um, Action Mental Health and indeed other um, mental health charities in, in recent times. Um, I, I haven't, I haven't, to, to, to be honest, I haven't. Um, met with the charity to discuss their proposal, or indeed the, the range of charities that, that were involved in that suggestion, to, to, to hollow out exactly what they mean by a mental health champion and what that might specifically do. I'm happy to, to have that discussion, and I'm sure uh, members would encourage me in doing that. Um, you know, I, I think that there are, we just need to be, to be careful, I suppose, of appointing somebody who has that sort of a role for the whole of, of everybody with mental health conditions in Northern Ireland. There's a breadth of very different mental health um, conditions. Um, which are where people are already being supported through, for example, say the work of the Victims Commissioner or the Older Persons Commissioner or a range of other um, public uh, bodies and, and um, public appointments. Um, so we just need to make sure that it would be something that would actually improve the situation and wouldn't perhaps um, confuse things further and, and add to the sometimes myriad of, of commissioners and champions that we have right across the public sector. Thank you. And I call Mr Andy Allen. Two, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, provisionally at the end of uh, December 2015, 32,544 patients were waiting longer than 52 weeks for a first outpatient appointment. I wish to make it clear, Mr. Speaker, that I find these figures totally unacceptable. It is regrettable that more people are waiting to be seen and are, longer, are waiting longer due to the financial constraints that led to the decision to suspend independent sector and additional in-house activity last year. It was extremely frustrating that £9.5 million pounds this year was being lost back every month to, uh, back to Westminster from Northern Ireland's public finances each and every month as a result of welfare reform being blocked. Such a sum could have funded many thousands of assessments and procedures. However, I welcome the allocation of an additional £40 million pounds from the November monitoring round, which will go towards tackling waiting lists, and it is expected to benefit many thousands of patients who would otherwise be waiting. Since November, significant efforts have been made across the health and social care system within a very tight time frame to secure additional outpatient clinics and treatments within trusts, and to put in place appropriate arrangements with independent sector organisations to transfer suitable patients for assessment and or treatment. Of course, this is just a start and much more additional funding will be needed to get us back to where we previously were. But we are now moving in the right direction and I hope that patients, particularly those waiting the longest, will see the benefit of this as soon as possible. Thank you. And I call Mr Allen for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. The number of patients waiting beyond the maximum of 18 weeks is shocking. So those waiting longer than 52 are being wholly failed. Does the Minister agree with me? of my concerns that those patients waiting longer than the, 50, than the 18 weeks sorry, are being forced into an instance where they may be being put at greater risk? I, I repeat the point to, that, I, that I made in the original answer to, to the member that I don't find um, these waiting lists um, acceptable. Uh, I think they are far too long and I, and I look to 
the board and particularly to the trust to, to deal with um, the very long waiting list that they have. And, and, to, and to, to be fair, um, this has been this has been occurring in the backdrop of, of various different things that have been happening, not least the, an increase, a, a pretty significant increase in the last number of years uh, by 14 per cent of the number of referrals um, for outpatient appointments. So there's been a huge increase um, at the same time as uh, the budget of my department has been under pressure. And I don't find the waiting lists um, acceptable, but ne neither did I find acceptable the fact that um, we were losing. Um, tens of millions of pounds each and every month because of our failure to move forward, sorry, the failure of some to move forward with welfare reform. The executive lost around £200 million from its coffers over the last three years because of our inability to, to, to agree welfare reform legislation in this place. Uh, and whilst I don't think that my department would have had dibs on, on all of that money, if we had a, had our, our share commensurate with the, uh, the rest of the budget, which would have been close to half, uh, we would have made a significant dent into those waiting lists. And it is interesting when you look at the, the figures, we had been making significant um, and positive progress in eating into waiting lists over the last number of years, uh, and they have went in the, decisively in the wrong direction, I have to say, um, round about the time that the independent sector contract uh, and the ability to fund more in-house activity, was that, that tap was turned off uh, by my predecessor because of the difficult financial circumstances that he found uh, the department to be in. So I don't find it acceptable, but it is another example, I hope, Mr. Uh, Speaker, of where we are now, thankfully, making investments, some £40 million pounds going in to help between 60 and 70,000 patients. Uh, and I would expect the member uh, and his constituents, and indeed other members in their constituents, to start seeing the benefits of that. Uh, if they haven't already started to see them, to so start to see them very soon. Thank you. And call Ms. Maeve McLaughlin. In relation to the impact of, of welfare and indeed the ultimate result that would make more people sick, make more people ill in relation to some of his party's approach to this issue. But I'm asking specifically in relation to waiting times, will the Minister consider the um, imposition of referral to treatment targets that have been put in place uh, in other countries internationally? The member may take exception with what I have said, but I certainly take exception with what she has said about the approach of the DUP or indeed any other party in this House in, in um, seeking to move forward with welfare reform legislation that we weren't necessarily happy with either, but had fought the fight at Westminster against it when others were absent, um, and then sought to deliver the best possible deal for Northern Ireland. I don't accept the uh, criticism that that has made people sick, because, and I don't want to get into some sort of argument with the member opposite about the fact that they have ultimately then signed up to that welfare reform legislation, because I do think we have at least, we have at least now moved forward and beyond that, hopefully, uh, and that has freed up uh, a very welcome injection of £40 million into waiting lists in Northern Ireland, which, as I said, is, is going to make sure that over the, some have already got their treatment, some are getting their treatment, some will get their treatment in the next number of weeks, but between 60 and 70,000 patients across a range of specialism will get the, the help and the care that they need. I, I, I'm, I'm content to, to look at um, ways in which we can look at targets. I mean, targets, I think, are, are important. Sometimes we focus a little bit too much on the targets and not looking at sometimes the, the qualitative rather than the quantitative aspects of all of those. And, I, and I'm, I'm content to certainly have a conversation and, and, and consider uh, other targets that other jurisdictions have had to see whether uh, they have put in place and to see what impact that they have had and whether they are a more accurate measure uh, of the reality of the situation. I'm not sure that all of them, I'm not saying specifically in this case, but a lot of the targets that the health and social care system has to look after sometimes are, 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 are achieve uh, aren't always uh, up to date and aren't always uh, clinically that beneficial. So I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to have a conversation and look at uh, other ways in which we might measure uh, targets for, for waiting times. Mr. Mr. Speaker, could I ask uh, the Minister um, how many patients are being helped by the investment of £40 million pounds in waiting lists? And also, does the Minister feel that the expert panel will result in more timely uh, access to procedures and appointments? Well, th thank the member for his question. I, I, there are uh, initially, I, I, I think in, in public pronouncements around the expenditure of, of the, the 40 million, I think I, I underestimated uh, our ability to, to um, in terms of the numbers of people who would receive uh, the outpatient appointments or the uh, inpatient day case or other treatments that they, they would need. And um, I think I talked around about sort of 40,000 getting um, 
I'd pay up to 40,000 getting outpatient appointments and about 15,000 getting, getting treatments. Uh, it, it looks like it's going to be much, much higher than that. It's going to be between 60 and, and 70,000 patients. That's going to be across a, a range of, uh, of specialisms. It's going to be, as I say, outpatients. It's going to be inpatients and day cases. It's also going to be uh, allied health professional activity, so people will get appointments with physiotherapists and occupational therapists and others, and there will be many diagnostic tests and scans and so forth as well. Um, so there is a range of specialisms, a range of type of activity that some 60 to 70,000 people will, will benefit from. And, and that won't by, by any means solve the problem, but it is a, a sizable chunk of the problem that will be uh, dealt with. Uh, there will obviously be more people who will come onto the waiting list in the intervening period, and that's why it's incredibly important that we continue to keep up uh, that level of investment in um, elective care into the next budget period as well. The, the expert panel won't in and of itself uh, look particularly at this issue, but what I do hope that it does, and, and this is a significant week for, for it and its work, Mr. Speaker, we are uh, having a, our summit tomorrow, um, um, and I would hope that that might be able to find some agreement on a, on a way forward in terms of an agreed set of principles. But what I do hope as the outcome of all of that work is that we we, we agree to create a, a not just a, a better uh, health service in Northern Ireland, but a more efficient health service in Northern Ireland. Uh, and one of the things in which I think it should be looking at how it could be efficient is how we can better deliver the elective care that, that our population needs. And that can obviously be done much better if we have a much more efficient system than the one we currently have. I am pleased to say that over the past 10 years there has been an increase in cervical screening coverage rates in Northern Ireland. In 2005 the coverage rate was 71 per cent and by the 31st of March 2015 the rate was 77 per cent. The target coverage for cervical screening is 80 per cent and for some age groups this target is being met. Work is ongoing to improve uptake in all age groups by promoting and supporting informed decision making. It is vital that people who, when invited uh, participate in cancer screening programs as these programs are important public health initiatives aimed at reducing deaths from cancer in our population. Thank you, and Mrs. Cameron, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer thus far and, and welcome um, those statistics. Um, will the Minister introduce HPV testing as a primary screening test for cervical cancer, and can he also outline his position in relation to those women under the age of 25 years of age who may present themselves to their GP, to their GP with um, concerns and indeed maybe symptoms, and are requesting uh, a cervical um, smear test? Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for, for a question. I know it's an issue that the, the member has taken a, a long interest in and has been a, a passionate champion of. Um, in, in, in terms of the introduction of a human uh, papillomavirus HPV testing uh, as a primary screening test for, for cervical cancer, in January, the national, uh, UK National Screening Committee, from whom we take our, our advice in respect of, of screening matters, recommended the introduction of the HPV testing uh, as the primary screening test for cervical cancer. And the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland have now um, undertook, undertaken a, a scoping exercise for the introduction of HPV testing as a primary screening test in Northern Ireland's uh, cervical screening programme. Uh, and that will, we will assess the, the findings of all of that uh, as part of the scoping exercise. And I, and I hope that that work will come forward with conclusions very soon. And I would hope that we would also be introducing the HPV test. And I think that's, that's good news for people in Northern Ireland. In respect of the issue of, of under 25s, Whilst that is, and I think this has changed in recent times, and the member will be more familiar with this than me, that it used to be people who were aged 20 or over would, would, would get uh, smear tests. That rose to 25. I know there was a situation in Scotland where they were just that down to 20, but I understand that they're now back, moving back up to 25 as well. It's probably worth saying that if, if a GP uh, is worried about exceptional cases, and there will always be exceptional cases of people who present themselves with abnormalities, um, they can and should contact their local screening laboratory to arrange uh, a screening test if they deem it to be clinically appropriate. So, in essence, what I'm saying is that no one who is under the age of 25 who has uh, concerns, has abnormalities, um, should fear going to their GP and presenting their symptoms to them. They, they can get uh, cer cervical smear tests performed on them, even though they're under 25, because the doctor has clinically decided that that's appropriate, but given their, their set of circumstances. It is just the case, Mr. Speaker, that we won't be doing that universally for everybody under the age of 25, but in those cases where people present themselves and the GP thinks that it's appropriate, they can. Brilliant timing, Minister, just on the two minutes. And I call Rosie McCorley for a supplement. Can I ask the Minister 
Minister, uh, in terms of uh, raising public awareness, and, and he did allude to it, and it's very important in, in cases like this, as in all cases, but what, what form, or could you give us some more detail on what the public awareness campaign might look like? Gurum yeah, there, this was, it was something whenever I saw the question coming forward from Mrs Cameron, it was something that I was, was, was interested in as well in terms of you know, how are we um, advertising the need for people to present themselves for, when, when called for, to go for their, their, their tests. Um, and, and I think it's, it, it, it's good to see that there has been an increase. We're still not quite at that 80 per cent target. There are some age groups who are um, well in excess of that 80 per cent target, particularly younger people. Um, um, so those around the age of 25, 30, 35 are now um, uh, exceeding that, that 80 per cent target. There is a range of um, advertising and promotional work that goes on, which is monitored on, a reg monitored on a regular basis by the Public Health Agency. So there are information, there's the sort of usual things that you would expect around information leaflets. Um, there have been videos, there is a dedicated website, there have been um, focus group work has, has um, been carried out with those who attend and those who don't attend. Uh, particularly with those who don't attend to find out why they don't attend and what we can do to further tailor the service to make sure that they, they, any fears or concerns that they might have are, are alleviated. Uh, and one interesting piece of work that the member might be interested in is that the, the PHA has been working with the Women's Resource and Development Agency to particularly target those groups who haven't, uh, have lower rates of, of attendance for, for tests um, to see again what the particular issues are and what work can be done through that network. Uh, to try to, to get more people to come forward, because at the end of the day, this is a, an exceptionally important public health message, uh, and we're not just doing these tests for, tests for the sake of it. This is about saving people's lives, uh, and I think that um, we will make every effort that we possibly and reasonably can um, to increase the uptake of these tests, because they're, they're just so, so critically important. Mr. Loris Kelly. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And I'm sure, uh, like me, he will lament the loss of uh, the late Una McCrutton, who was a great advocate uh, for cervical screening. But I can ask the Minister, in relation to the vaccination programme in schools with, with, with young women, what has the uptake been like uh, in that population? Not, I, don't, I don't think I have the information about what has uh, happened in school. I, I mean, if I, it may be something that the Minister of Education maybe has better information about, but I'm, I'm certainly happy to to go away and um, get that information and, and give that to, to the member in, in due course. I, I, I think, as with a lot of public health messages, the, the earlier and the sooner and the younger people get the, uh, without obviously, you know, in, in an appropriate manner, because we don't want to scare people unnecessarily either, particularly young people, um, but the sooner we can get that message out that looking after your health in every aspect is, is incredibly important, the better, and, and I think I'm, I'm very keen to work with schools. I know the public health agency do, does that in a range of different ways, and as do our, the board and the trust as well. Um, so certainly I'm happy to, to, to come back to the member with any information that I might have or if it's uh, in the domain of the uh, Minister of Education, I'll ensure that he passes it on to the member. Thank you. And I'll call Mr. Alistair Ross. Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Public Health Agency is leading the response to Zika virus in Northern Ireland and it has issued advice to health professionals in December 2015 and again in February of, of this year. The PHA also issued a press release in early February giving advice to pregnant women as well as providing up-to-date information on its website. It is important to note that Zika virus is an infection transmitted by mosquitoes which are not native to Northern Ireland and therefore the public health risk posed by Zika virus in Northern Ireland is extremely low uh, and no greater than the risks posed by other mosquito-borne infections such as malaria, for example. Uh, also, uh, or almost all cases of the virus are acquired through mosquito bites and not through human-to-human -human contact, although a very small number of cases have occurred through sexual transmission. At the moment, the key actions for Northern Ireland are to ensure that travellers to and from infected areas, especially pregnant women, receive appropriate advice and that clinicians are aware of the symptoms in and where appropriate the actions to be taken for returning travellers. And call Mr Ross for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's obviously one of those things that has caused a great deal of concern uh, right across the world when we see the images and the horrific uh, outcomes of, of the virus. Can I ask the Minister what specific advice his department are offering those who would find themselves travelling to South America and what steps they can take to make sure that they're protected? Mr Speaker, the, the Public Health Agency is, is understandably and rightly advising particularly pregnant women uh, and those who are, are planning pregnancy to, to consider avoiding uh, travel to any country or any area where uh, Zika virus outbreaks are, are reported. Um, Zika outbreaks are, have been reported in a, a number of countries, in, in, as the member says, in, in South America and also in, in Central America, and all travellers to uh, affected countries should ensure that they seek 
travel health advice from their GP or indeed a travel clinic well in advance of their, their trip. A possible link between exposure to the Zika virus during pregnancy and microcephaly and other congenital malformations has, has been identified and is being investigated and women returning from the affected countries should avoid getting pregnant for, for 28 days. Anyone who has been in uh, an affected country needs to be particularly mindful of the signs and indeed the symptoms of the infection and if necessary they should contact their GP who will offer the appropriate advice. Uh, Mr. Speaker, updated advice on the Zika virus can also be accessed through the Northern Ireland Direct and the PHA websites, and I would encourage anybody who is travelling to those areas to, to consider that advice very, very carefully. Thank you. And comes to Fergal McKinney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, of course, there, there were two cases in the Republic, and what conversations is his department having with uh, uh, colleagues in the South, in the Department of Health in the South, in relation to ensuring full protection on the island? Officials from, as you would, I mean, this, this would be standard practice in, in situations like this. It doesn't matter what the virus or what the, the, the condition or illness might be. Uh, officials from my department would, would be in touch and have indeed in this case been in touch with their counterparts in the Department of Health in Ireland to ensure that any particular queries regarding the issue are, are, are discussed as, as required. Um, at a, and it is, it is not a Northern Ireland, I think it's important to stress, not a Northern Ireland based response is required or indeed a, just a, an Irish Ireland wide response but something that is international and obviously our UK response as a whole is being led by, by Public Health England and the, and the Public Health Agency's Health Protection Service is working very closely with colleagues in Public Health England uh, and contributes to quite twice weekly teleconferences which are organised by Public Health England. The Public um, Health Agency has, as I've said, also been in touch with the Health Service Executive in the Republic of Ireland to ensure appropriate guidance and information is, is disseminated on, on both sides of the, the border. Thank you. And it comes to Chris Little. Question five. Mr Speaker, following the decision made by uh, Four Seasons Healthcare to close some nursing homes, I, I asked the Health and Social Care Board to halt and review the current process examining the future role and function of statutory residential care homes as a precautionary measure. I want to develop a broader understanding of the issues facing the residential and nursing home sector and their implications before making any final decision on the future of statutory homes. It's also right to pause and reflect and give careful consideration to issues arising in the independent sector. Terms of reference for the review are as follows to re-examine the proposals for closures in light of the emerging challenges facing the adult care sector in particular to consider issues around capacity, accessibility, quality and sustainability. And this will include reconsideration of the local needs assessment exercises which informed the original proposals for change, to consider whether sufficient independent sector capacity can be identified to ensure a secure supply of appropriate places on a regional basis to meet demand, to consider the timing of any proposed closures with particular reference to the current perceived instability in the market, and finally to consider whether there is a requirement to review the current position on admissions as a means of addressing current challenges in the car sector. Yeah, Mr. Little for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his helpful update in relation to this matter. Uh, can I ask the Minister whether he could go into any more detail in terms of uh, his review of the sustainability of the independent residential and nursing home sector, uh, such as issues relating to trust aid, staff costs and, and nurse shortage, uh, and advise the House when he will indeed be reporting uh, on this review and how many of the 254 older people uh, that were affected by the closures have been appropriately resettled to date? Quite a few um, questions raised, not um, one single question by the member. Um, maybe the, the, the member beside him might, might welcome the fact that I'm now on to question five in this question time, but um, help being held now back by, I think, the, the seven or eight questions that the member has asked. Um, the, um, there, was, the, there, has been, there has been there has been work. Um, in terms of the last issue, which is probably the most important in terms of uh, how it directly affects uh, individuals. Um, there has been obviously quite good work has been going on by our trusts coordinating with residents and particularly with their families to ensure that their transition to new accommodation has been smooth. And I know that one of the homes in the members' constituency, I think it's the Victoria one, everybody has now moved to appropriate accommodation and accommodation where they are. And I'm sure nobody wanted to move to it. I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm move away and I'm unwilling to use the word content to move to, but in the circumstances, I think everybody has found appropriate accommodation. Uh, and work is ongoing in many of the other homes as well. Um, in respect of um, the issues around the, the examination of the, the independent sector, I think it's critically important that we do take some time as well as looking at 
statutory residential care homes and, and doing the work that I have outlined in, in my initial response, they will also take the time to look at the independent sector and, and what is happening there. Uh, and that's why I did commission a piece of work to look at the stability, the, the market stability of the sector and any threats that there are to it. That will obviously examine a range of issues, including nursing and, and, and um, overall viability of many of those businesses. Um, I, I have um, responded to those pressures in recent times by um, announcing a, a further investment in this financial year of £1.6 million to uh, the care sector. And that goes in, in two different ways, a 2% increase in domicili the rates paid to domiciliary care companies, and also £11 a week more for every resident who has been traced, placed in a home by a, a trust. Uh, and that will not solve all of the problems, and I know that, but it will hopefully bring some further stability to the market, deal with them, uh, some of the issues that are currently around, particularly around retention of staff, and then hopefully move us into a more uh, stable position in the future. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. David McNary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I need to read this to get it right. Uh, will the Minister detail the impact his usage of the private sector will have on reducing the waiting list for people in pain awaiting a hospital procedure? Thank, thank the member for, for his, um, his question. I mean, th th this is a. I think there, there are some in this, um, some in this house, some in this country who. Um, turn their noses up at the use of um, the independent sector to help to deal with issues such as our, our, our unacceptably long waiting lists. I know the member is not one of those, uh, and neither am I. And we have been using um, the, the £40 million pounds that we got through the November monitoring round, Mr. Mr. Speaker. We have been using to, uh, as I said earlier in response to your earlier questions, to treat 60 to 70,000 more patients in a range of different ways. Um, and obviously, we want to maximise. Um, the output coming from inside the health and social care sector, and there has been an increase in outpatients, or there will be an increase in, in outpatients appointments of around 9,000, around 1,000 more inpatient day cases, and also 15,000 more AHP, so physiotherapy and occupational therapy, occupational health um, appointments, and also 13,000 more diagnostic tests done. But we have been relying quite significantly on the independent sector. They have been awarded 27,000 uh, contracts for outpatient appointments and 8,000 uh, inpatient appointments. And all of those have now, patients have been referred for all of those. So all of those uh, appointments are being taken up and if many people have been seen already, some are being seen and some will be seen in the weeks ahead. And you know, it, it, without that capacity, without that additional capacity, uh, whatever people might think about using that, whatever, but the facts are this, without that additional capacity, there are over 30,000 people requiring outpatient, or procedure, or outpatient appointments or inpatient procedures who wouldn't have been able to get those. I don't think in the circumstances that we find ourselves in it would have been acceptable to do anything other than use the independent sector to, to, to deliver those appointments, those much needed appointments for over 30,000 people in Northern Ireland. For I suspect, uh, Speaker, that most, if not all, people in pain uh, don't give a toss or care who does the procedure at the end of the day. Could the Minister say, tell the House what uh, the cost differences work out um, between the private and the uh, public sector? And in doing so, can he say how he believes the spare capacity of the private sector is sitting there and not being matched by the NHS? And on the news today, uh, Minister, uh, why do we have the worst record for stillbirths? Uh, is that anything to do with the lack of resources? No, I, I, I'll deal with the, 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 first, the first points first and then come on to the other um, issue as well. Um, the, the, there, is, there is a misconception sometimes that you know, pe people who are opposed to using the independent sector will use words like profiteering and, um, you know, that, as if it's a bad word to make a profit in this society. But, in, in these circumstances, they, they are not paid, the independent sector are not paid any more for the operation than what it would cost to provide that operation inside the health and social care system. That's an important point that is very, very often missed or ignored by some who would, would, would criticise the use of the independent sector. And clearly, they have a much a more efficient model. There are 
particular pressures within the health and social care system and makes it difficult to get to that um, sort of level of efficiency. But as I said in response to, to Mr. Easton, uh, you know, I would hope that some of the, the changes and reforms that we envisage through the work of the panel might allow us to, to produce an even more efficient system that would allow us to get up towards that level of, of efficiency that the independent sector provides. On the issue of stillbirths, which has been a, a subject which has been in the media for the last number of days, and, and I don't think treated in all areas of the media with the sensitivity that it, it should be. Um, I mean, this is every single stillbirth, whatever the circumstances, is a tragedy for the people involved, the family involved, the, the parents involved. And, you know, there is some sort of contrived league table has now been produced by, by some in the media, uh, which is, whereas there is no joy to be had whether you're at the top or whether you're at the bottom of that league table because of the individual tragedies that each of them add up to. I don't think there was proper or sufficient scrutiny um, from some in the media about um, and no real reflection on Northern Ireland's particular circumstances. And I don't want to uh, invite upon the House another debate that, like the one that we had last Wednesday night, but it has been recognised by uh, many midwives um, in the press and some of the comments that they made that we are not comparing like with like whenever we compare Northern Ireland stillbirth figures because of issues around termination and abortion in Northern Ireland. Adrian Cochran, what? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I was privileged last Friday to tour the Antrim Emergency Department and humbled to meet and talk to the staff. Uh, Minister, that department was forecast on Friday to be looking at admissions of 270 people over the 24 hour period. It was forecast to be the busiest ED in Northern Ireland, and it consistently is first, second, or third busiest ED. Considering, Minister, it was commissioned originally to, to comfortably cope with about 240, and unfortunately it's, it's seeing that figure um, continually um, overwhelming the staff. Is there any help and support that could be uh, offered by yourself? I, and and I, would, I would echo what the member has said in terms of the um, dedication of the staff at Andrew Maria Hospital, Mr Speaker. I, I, um, I visited during the, the, um, the week a very busy uh, pressures, very high pressures on the service just back at the start of the year. I actually visited the Andrew Maria Hospital's ED myself. And, and what, I, what I noticed was, yes, it was incredibly busy. It was busy. But you had a, a staff who were deeply committed to what they were doing, really dedicated to their work, and absolutely in control of what was a very difficult situation. Um, and I commend them for the work that they, they put in, not just over the, the Christmas period or the early New Year period, where it's, it's always very, very busy, but right across, right, right around the whole year. Uh, and in terms of support, and, and there have been issues in the past at the Andrew Maria Hospital. But again, I, I recognise the efforts that have been put in by the Trust under new leadership in that Trust. Uh, and I have every faith in that leadership and the work that they are doing. And I think they are slowly but surely starting to turn the situation around there. It's far from perfect. Um, that Yes, they're under pressure. That reflects a pressure right across uh, the service, where you have had in the, last, um, in the last five years, there has been an increase of nearly 14% in unplanned admissions right across Northern Ireland, and places like Andrew Maria have borne perhaps the brunt of that. In, res in recognition of that, uh, Mr Speaker, I have invested uh, £8 million additional in, in winter pressures this year. Um, a share of that will have gone to the Northern Trust, over a, over a million pounds of that will have gone to, to Northern Trust to deal with the, the pressures that they are facing. And, and, I, and I hope that they can, even in spite of those pressures that they are facing, continue to make some of them, continue with the improvements that they have made in recent times. Mr Cochrane Watson, for Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, can I thank you and agree with you on your um, commitment to the staff and your commitment to the leadership and the senior management team of the Trust? Can I also highlight to you, Minister, one of the concerns raised by the senior staff and indeed the doctors at the ED, and that was the, as they termed it, the back end of the service, where people were being bed blocked, the care packages weren't being put in place, and we were looking at the availability of beds. As they did highlight, people were waiting on trolleys, but they were being treated, drugs were being administered, MRI scans, x-rays, but there was still this wait time. And it was all down to the, the back end, as they termed it, of the service. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think that, that um, I always listen to, to people who are on the front line uh, and, the, and their experiences and what they're telling me. And that's certainly the message that I got in Antrim um, earlier in January when I was there, and indeed from talking to, to other emergency departments and, and the pressures that they're facing. It was in the, the, the emergency department in the, 
Southwest Acute Hospital on Friday, and again had a, had a similar message from them. And I think what we have been what we have been doing over the last number of years, if I look at and reflect back on um, performance, particularly around this time of the year where there is a, a spike in activity, um, that um, our emergency departments have been able to cope. Um, with um, a range of pressures that they've been facing, but there have been different problems, different broad problems that have appeared in each year, which we have then in the subsequent year then sought to address through funding and through various innovations. Uh, and this year, the, the problem that was quite acute in terms of, of pressures was that of, as a member describes it, the back end, if we can, if we can call it that. And, and people are getting treated quite, quite quickly in many instances. And I, and I, and I sat and reviewed the, the website, which updates the, the times that it takes for people to get treated uh, over the Christmas period. And, and it, was, it was interesting that in many cases, the times were quite low to be able to, for people to be seen, but they were taking a lot. So it, on, on superficially looking at it, you would say that there shouldn't be a problem in that emergency department. The problem was coming from the fact that people couldn't then uh, leave and get the care packages that are required or get a bed in, in the hospital. So I think that we've identified that as a, as a problem for next year and it's certainly something we're going to have to address. It, it fil uh, fits in with the question that Mr Little asked in respect of the uh, independent care sector around the, the pressures that that sector is facing and that's why I'm keen to support and bolster and ensure the stability of that sector so that we can use it to alleviate some of the pressures that our, our emergency departments and the air hospitals are, are in general are facing. Thank you. Call Mr Alec Atwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister uh, to confirm the number of cases uh, referred to his department of persons infected with the H1N1 virus? And I'm being specific in that regard. And are you satisfied, Minister, that all uh, information that should be put into the public domain in relation to the risk um, and the cases? is being put into the public domain by the trusts or by the other health authorities? I thank the member for his question. It's again it's a bit like the, the, the question Mr Ross asked, an issue that causes concern amongst our, our community whenever we hear uh, some of the stories and some of the possible deaths connected to uh, what is colloquially referred to as a swine flu. During the 2015-16 flu season, I'm just, I'll, give the, I'll reflect back on the question and see whether there, uh, this doesn't fulfil it or not, but during the 15-16 flu season, there have been 303 lab-confirmed cases of seasonal flu in Northern Ireland. 239 of those uh, cases were the H1N1 strain. Um, the main defence that's in place for seasonal flu, which would include that, that strain, is, is the annual vaccination programme. I think we've we procured uh, I think 675,000 of those viruses in Northern Ireland uh, this year. Um, and protection against um, H1N1 is contained within that seasonal flu vaccination. There have, of course, been some issues, some problems, and, and many of those will, without speaking authoritatively about every case, many of those will in, uh, involve people who have underlying health conditions where the, the uh, vaccination hasn't been able to work in the full way that it, that it would be hoped to. Uh, but for supplement. Uh, following up on the last point that the Minister made, uh, can you confirm the number of deaths where uh, H1N1 has been the cause of death or a contributory factor to the death? And to go back to my previous question, are you satisfied that in terms of the scale of the threat, that all that, should, that can be done is being done in terms of bringing information to the attention of the public and interventions in order to protect the public? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have the, the information to um, relate to the first one. I suspect that might be as much because um, analysis of all of that is still going on, just to, to make sure that if we say that that is the case, that it is absolutely the case. And again, we don't, in so doing, um, scare unnecessarily people in Northern Ireland. I think we have to be very, very sensitive around the need to provide, yes, timely information, but also accurate infor information to people. And I think we are, um, and everybody in the system is open and honest in terms of referring to it. Yes, there are our issues with H1N1 swine flu, um, but that the vaccination programme which we have in place is the best defence against that. And that's why we procure so many of these um, vaccinations each year. That's why it's promoted so heavily. Um, and that's why we encourage so many people to, to take up those vaccinations to act as a defence against um, influenza of whatever type it might be. Yes, but I'm sorry, there will not be time for a supplementary. Not, not your fault, Mr Speaker. Um, the, the Minister will be aware the Prime Minister is promising a billion pounds spend in England to end discrimination between physical and, and mental illness. 
Can the Minister assure mental health sufferers in Northern Ireland that they're not going to be the poor cousins uh, within the United Kingdom? I, I very much welcome the announcement from the Prime Minister, um, not even just because of the monetary aspect of it, which I'll come back to, but the fact that somebody as senior as the Prime Minister has come out and said what he has said. And I think it's incredibly important, Mr Speaker, that, that, that all of us in, in public life, but particularly those in positions like the Prime Minister, does talk about the importance of mental health, not versus physical health, but alongside physical health and the impact that, that poor mental health can have on one's physical health. Um, the additional resources are, are very welcome, and, and, and the member would know that in my position in this department, we will welcome resources wherever they come from. I'm still analysing exactly what the Prime Minister means by an additional billion and whether that is a, another additional billion or whether that's a billion that is included in the eight billion uh, increase. I've seen one recent report that says that this is part of the overall eight billion by the end of the, the decade. Um, and, and, and I think that in those circumstances, I think we, we have a I'm not saying that we're absolutely where we need to be in terms of our levels of expenditure in Northern Ireland. The member is well versed in the acuity of the problem in Northern Ireland and some of the particular circumstances causing that in Northern Ireland, particularly related to our past. Uh, but I'm, I'm very I'm, I'm pleased to see, though, a note that a, a report um, with the BBC uh, over the weekend, looking at what sparked some of this debate and helped to spark some of this debate, show that of all of the regions in the United Kingdom, the only region to have increased expenditure on mental health in the last two years was Northern Ireland. We increased it by 1% last year and by around 2.5% uh, this year. And whilst that doesn't resolve all of the problems and it isn't the full answer, it, is, it does show the commitment, uh, of my commitment, this department's commitment, the executive's commitment to invest further in mental health um, because of the particular problems that we face in Northern Ireland, never mind the, the general problems that, that people in Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK are facing in respect of, of poor mental health. And time is up. And before we return to the consideration stage of the mental capacity bill, members will wish to take their ease while we change the top table. <laughs>